Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here this morning. I would like to spend a, a moment of time talking to you about um, the uh, embracing a culture of respect and civility in the workplace. It also means being aware of each other. It also talks about achieving cultural competency. And sometimes when I speak, um, people think of cultural responsibilities as, you know, we're all from different areas. But it does mean that in many cases, it means that in the respect that you come from different sections of one same organization, you are of different age groups. So it's getting to know each other in the workplace. So one of the ways that we can define that is that we are showing respect for our coworkers with words and actions. We're making a commitment that reflects that we recognize other people as human beings and have mutual, um, and that we have mutual and equal partners in the workplace. So we are all the same and we all deserve, deserve the same respect. So I'm just gonna sh start off with this short video. It's just something to kind of get you, uh, just get you thinking. Yeah. There should be volume. A manager or supervisor. The employee may outright refuse to carry out a responsible direct order, challenge or criticize an order, ignore or not follow instructions fully, show open disrespect, use abrasive language, have an attitude problem, rolling of the eyes, sighs, poor body language, make malicious statements or threats. Insubordinate behavior may start out small, but left uncorrected can snowball and become progressively worse, so must be addressed early. Most instances can be nipped in the bud with a brief word or corrective coaching. Before deciding on appropriate actions to take, assess the situation to determine if the problem is a misconduct or performance problem. Now, if the behavior is a performance problem, ensure the employee has been trained on the skills required to complete their job. If the behavior is a problem of misconduct, assess the situation to see if you can identify the root problem. Let's take a look how to deal with direct insubordination. Schedule a meeting with the employee behind closed doors. Don't react emotionally. Remain calm and maintain a professional demeanor and tone at all times. Explain what they did wrong and the impact this has. Focus on facts. Avoid using generic words like attitude. Set out the conduct that is expected in the future. And make it clear the consequences of violating terms in the future and what disciplinary action you have at your disposal. Document everything including date of incident, witnesses, nature of insubordination, exact words used, and the nonverbal reactions of the employee. Ask the employee to sign the document. Place in the employee file. For more information, please click on the link below. So we can um, think, when we think of disrespect and inappropriate words, we can look at it as many different ways and facets. So what I'm going to do this morning, I wanted to show you that because that was an easy way of how we can deal with things. But life isn't that easy. So the objectives that we're going to cover this morning is understanding the meaning of respect and what it is and what it is not, uh, inappropriateness of the workplace, and we're going to just take a quiz, and I'm not expecting everybody to shout out answers because this is not the environment, but I am going to ask you that if you say you agree, to just put up your hand, and if you don't agree, you won't. We're going to determine the appropriate resources to utilize when a problem exists or occurs, we are going to understand the consequences of behaving inappropriately, and we're going to look at achieving cultural competency in the workplace and how we should work and deal with each other. So, so let's do the first one. So if you think it's true, please raise your hand. If you don't, if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to assume that you're saying, telling me that it's false. So behaving appropriately, appropriately means not having a laugh with work colleagues. Is, do you believe that to be true or false? Behaving appropriately means not having a laugh with work colleagues. Do you believe that to be true or false? Thank you. So it is false. We need to differentiate the difference between laughing with 
and laughing at. And be aware that, that making an individual the object of your jokes or the continuous uh, repetition, uh, recipient of it may be deemed inappropriate and more things can follow from that. Each individual has to make it clear what behavior is okay and not okay for them when they join the firm or the team. One person says true, to a couple of people say true, so is that that the majority say that it's false? Okay, it is actually up to the organization to prepare and produce policies we cannot have each member deciding that this is what I don't want to happen to me or I do want to happen to me. It is the responsibility of your leaders to ensure that there is one policy throughout and it's consistent and it's available after legal has looked at it. Okay. Managers have a legal obligation to provide a harassment-free environment at work. Amen, exactly. True, managers are responsible for adhering to the organizational policies and procedures and operate within the framework of the current employment legislation. Employment tribunals will examine this if it ever gets taken to tribunal and they will hold you responsible if you did not share it with your staff or it wasn't followed through. It's fine to tell risque jokes if you preface it with, I hope no one is offended by this. <laughs> I take it we all have the answer to that one. Is that true or false? Yeah, it is false. The fact that you've even started to say that sentence means that you're going to offend. Okay. Now this is for any age. Sometimes people think that Facebook is only for teenagers and for young adults. Well, our data shows us that middle-aged people and older are very comfortable with Facebook. So someone making inappropriate comments about their employers on their own private Facebook page could have disciplinary action taken against them. Yeah. And I can tell you quickly a story that happened, well, it's not a story, it's true, that happened in my organization. We had a closed Facebook page, or some employees did. They had a closed Facebook page, they were employees in the emergency department, and they were using this to share experiences of their day. So you can imagine, in Harrisburg, emergency department, a lot of things happen. But what they went on to do was to talk about they didn't like this particular person who was also employed. They talked about the gender of a patient. They talked about the obesity of another patient. So one might think, is that appropriate words? Probably not. But what it was was that they were talking about their organization and they were sharing it. And somebody was invited to go onto Facebook page to join it. And they saw what they considered was inappropriate, and they reported it. All 12 people were fired. They contested, they took it to the news, and so on and so on, and it has since died a death because it's been about the last five years, and they've never been able to win a case of it on it. Even though they keep on arguing this was our own Facebook page, it makes no difference. You still have to be appropriate even when you're outside of your organization if you're talking about your organization. So you have to think about that. And that is also one person who was in there who basically said, not on my team, because they were part of this. And even people who did not write anything or comment because they didn't say anything, they were fired also. So it's something to bear in mind. Okay, so I'm gonna look at another vignette with you, and um, you don't have to read this, it's a busy slide, and again, think about this, this can be in any workplace whatsoever. As a young adult, I waited tables at an Italian restaurant in my hometown. The staff was a typical collection of teenagers, and they may not be in a different environment, college dropouts, townies, and single moms. You'd expect a suburban casual dining establishment. Our boss, Jeff, was an, an outrageous flirt, but his banter was generally accepted as harmless 
occasionally a welcoming distraction from a frenzy of a dinner rush. So that's not dissimilar to the hospital where sometimes people, they accept things because they're all in a stressful environment and they get together because they just want to be, you know, they just want to let go and let go of what's going on with them. So one night at a pre-dinner meeting, Jeff lectured us on the proper cleaning technique of a mini of the mini fridges under the counter. You had to kneel down and get at the back corners, he explained. He paused, pointing to one of the waitresses. Come on, Carrie, you know what it's like to spend plenty of time on your knees. And then, while the entire staff looked on, he made a classic tongue-in-cheek gesture. So think about your own environment. What would you do? What would you do? So, would you discuss it privately with him, that his remarks were offensive to not only Carrie, but to you also? Would you laugh about it and be glad that he didn't say anything like that to you? He was only joking, you thought. Or would you report the incident to his superiors? So there's many things that you could have done here. If you discussed it privately with, to him, as some people, as I heard earlier in the pre pre previous presentations, if they discussed it privately or they reported to, to it to someone, they wanted something to happen. Just because you are not the person that this was directed to, you still have an obligation to do something. Because as we've just heard, there are no bystanders bystanders. If you were there, then you are part of it. If you're not part of the success of it, then you're part of what was going on, and that means that you were condoning it. Um, did you, are you going to laugh about it and be glad that he didn't say anything to you? Well, then that's when you become a by bystander, and from what I hear, there are no bystanders. He was only joking, so that's pretending like it didn't happen and it's okay. So you're actually saying it's okay. And what about the other person? How were, they, how were they feeling through all of this? You report the incident to his superiors, and that's what we absolutely have got to do. We have got to find what our course is, and we need to follow it. We need to already know that what policies are available for us, so we should know how to act accordingly. Or you could do the last one. You could speak to Carrie, but is that enough? Maybe you're speaking to Carrie to say, come on, I'll support you. Let's do something together. Maybe Carrie doesn't want to do anything. And, and we know in certain situations with sexual harassment, the person themselves doesn't want to do anything about it. But it doesn't mean that you don't have to. You can. If you were there and you were offended, you can start this ball rolling. So I'm just going to show. Um, sure. Absolutely. Yes, you can. Yes, you absolutely can say something right there and then. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is also, that's one of the best ways to do it, is to say something then and there, because you can make that person, you can embarrass the person so they won't do it again, or you can tell, let them know that this is not appropriate. It is not appropriate. And however he receives it is how he receives it, but you absolutely can. I have found in some of my research that people don't like to do that then, but it's certainly if you have the strength and the know-how and you just believe it to be wrong, please just do that. Okay, hopefully this should. I see you finally decided to come into work. Don't forget to fill out your leave slip. Mind your own business. I'll fill this out if you fill one out for the 30 minutes you were late on Tuesday. Well, at least when I come in late, I look like I spent the extra time getting ready. <laughs> That's what you think. Uh, oh, wait a minute. All right, ladies, let's play nice. She keeps coming in late every day, and I'm sick of it. It's not fair. I have to cover the phones. Then she has the nerve to take an hour and a half for lunch. I've told you about this before, and you keep letting her do it. So now you're talking about me behind my back, and you didn't even tell me about it. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Oh, that's Good morning, wonderful. everyone. Well, ladies, let's get back to work. We can talk about this later. I have to talk to Aiden about the potluck. I'll see you. So, Aiden, are you going to bring your mini quiches to the potluck? Yeah, we'll get to that. What was that all about? Oh, you know, 
Phoebe has this live-in boyfriend. He's so crazy, and she just keeps coming in late. And Roxy is just jealous. Her husband left her a year ago, and they just haven't been able to get along ever since. So what are you going to do about it? Oh, you know, they'll, the two of them will work it out. Let's get back to talking about your quiches. Have you thought about adding spinach to your quiches? Hmm. Spinach. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming in. I wanted to talk to you privately about what you're going to bring to the potluck. I thought you called me in here to talk about Roxy and harassing me. Oh, we'll get to that. I knew you were in here talking about me. Roxanne, come on in and have a seat. Now you two need to work this out. I knew you would be in here talking about me lying about you coming in late. I know you aren't calling me a liar, you big and Coleman sucker. I realize that things have gotten out of control with two employees I supervise. I'm planning to meet with them, but I need some guidance on what to say to them. Okay, I'm glad you called HR. Let's talk about it. They're yelling at each other, calling each other names, talking over each other, and accusing me of doing nothing. Do you write somebody up for this? What do you even call it? Now that I understand why you've been late and we've come up with a schedule, let's talk about the larger issue, which is your interaction with Roxy. You've been upset this morning. Roxy's been upset. Would you agree that there's a better way to handle this? You two have been down this road before. This behavior can't continue. It's important that we observe boundaries and standards in the workplace. Also, you both deal with the public and could find yourself on the receiving end of a difficult customer. We all encounter difficult people in the workplace and we need to be able to keep ourselves in check and respond appropriately. Yeah. I know, I probably said some things that took it a bit too far and probably set her off. Exactly. It's really important to recognize when somebody is crossing a boundary, not to engage, but not to ignore it. Remind yourself it's not about you, it's about the other person. So if you find yourself in a similar situation, here are some steps you can take to defuse the conflict. I see you finally decided to come into work. Don't forget to fill out your leave slip. Mind your own business. Send a signal you're not engaging by establishing some physical separation and boundary. For example, take a step back, put your hands out, but not in an aggressive way. Politely but firmly tell the other person the boundaries have been crossed without appearing to attack her. You can do this by avoiding you statements. Suggest a process for re resolving the situation. You know, it's not appropriate for us to talk to each other like this. Maybe we need to discuss it during break, and maybe we need to involve Sarah. We're ready for you to join us now, Roxy. We've had our individual meetings about being respectful in the workplace, and I truly appreciate your willingness to come together for a team discussion. It's my responsibility as a supervisor to ensure coverage, and I didn't do that. That was my failing, which allowed the conflict to escalate. I own that and apologize. I've put measures in place, which I will monitor. That's my commitment to you. Well, thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. But that doesn't excuse what happened, either between the two of you or how you spoke to me as your supervisor. Okay, I get it. I was out of line. Maybe. I mean, I didn't think of it that way. Certain things definitely cross boundaries, while others may be a little gray. I want both of you to take a look at this exercise that we'll do next week as a team. The purpose is to describe what respect looks like to you. Whatever happened to that thing about a mediation? Yeah, I'm interested in that too. Well, I'm glad you brought it up. I was going to cover that next. Here's the information. I would like for you all to read it, and if you're interested, give me your available dates, and then I'll contact our agency mediation coordinator.
Here it is, the last piece of apple pie. It's your favorite, right? Thank you. That is really sweet. Consider it a peace offering. <laughs> wow, what's in the punch? Those two are getting along for a change. I guess the boyfriend's gone? That was really inappropriate for me to say. I hope you can disregard that comment. Consider it done. Thanks. You really have come a long way. The team has come a long way. We may have issues, but we'll be able to handle them, and with respect. I can see that. Good for you. Good for us. Cheers. Cheers. And so, with a new understanding and commitment to respect in the workplace, the employees work together happily ever after. Okay. It's good seeing you, Aiden. Have a great day. Yep, great job today. I'll see you later. Thanks. So the reason why I'm showing you this video is that nothing is ever that simple. But, you know, in this respect, this was the manager. The manager didn't take responsibility. The manager, it didn't appear, was even trained, didn't even know what the organization's policy was. And this is why she was in denial. She tried to make out that um, nothing was going on and we can just let it go. So people need to be comfortable that they can speak to someone when the time arises, if the time ever arises. So therefore, that's why your policies are important. But it's not just the policies. They need to get to the person, and the person needs to be trained on it. And I know that's going to happen here, but the point is, this is what can happen. It goes on for too long. The manager also was, um, she broke confidentiality. What happens in a person's life is not the discussion of someone else. It is that there is a situation and we need to deal with it. And unfortunately, she took too long to deal with it. Now, this was maybe somewhat funny, but there are serious, um, there are serious situations where things need to be dealt with as soon as they're identified. So when we look at the cost of what it costs the organization, what it costs the employee, I'm just going to show you now some statistics that tell you how serious we're not talking necessarily about abuse. We're talking about words. We're talking, and words are bullying. So um, I'm going to show you some statistics now that, that tell you the impact it has on a, on a company. And as you've already seen by this slide, there was an employee, um, and all these statistics are true, that um, she was awarded $14,000 from her organization because it says that um, she was subjected to hostile work environment just because of her religious beliefs and that the city knew or should have known. And that's an interesting one because it said they should have known. So it doesn't tell me any more than did she report it and did they not take it seriously, therefore they didn't have any, anything on file or, or not. But the point is they say they should have known. So that again holds our managers and leaders responsible that they should know what's happening on their team. And as I say, they also had to, they, she received those award, uh, that compensation and also the attorney fees had to be paid. So that's just one and that's not even a huge cost. So when we look at more of the employee, and this has come from the US Department of Justice and Bureau um, of Justice, that 35% of employees experienced workplace bullying in 2010. There were a number of medical implications that were in the report, and those medical implication gets them appointments with us. It's like anxiety, depression, um, fear of going into um, spaces with other staff, these are the sort of things that can arise. 500,000 employees miss an equivalent of 1.7 million days worked annually. And that's equivalent to 3.5 um, incidents, uh, days per incident. So when you think about it, this is what it does to your organization. And 5 million in lost wages annually. And that's to the individual who have a family to support or maybe just themselves. But the point is, because nothing was done, this is the loss that they incur. And then when we think about the organization, the organization, again, increased medical and workers' compensation because when you go back to the employee, if they take time off sick, then you're likely to be paying medical. 
And if it's something that is already, um, uh, it, the organization knows about it, it may turn from just medical payment to workers' compensation because it happened in the workplace. And then there's the lawsuits, which more and more we are seeing more um, come, uh, uh, coming to the, to the light because, again, in my organization, we have people who are coming in for treatment they're on workers' comp because things happened in their organization. So um, they're getting ready for a lawsuit. And then other indirect costs, um, and I'm not sure if it happens here, but in most work environments, you may have to replace that person temporarily with a temp person. Additional costs here again. So these are some others that have been taken from the um, Harvard School of Business. 48% intentionally decreased their work efforts, so they didn't try when they got through the doors because they didn't see what the point was. 47% um, intentionally decreased the time they spent in the organization, so that's, again, is taking time off sick. 80% lost work time worrying, so that was where, that's where medical um, disorders can come into play. 63% lost time avoiding the offender. So if, if they are losing work time avoiding the offender, they obviously are not working. 66% of their performance declined. Um, the statistics told me that the performance in evaluation shows them that they were declining in their performance evaluation, but yet nothing was done about it. So again, this is, um, this is showing you statistics where um, there was nothing done about it. 78% said their commitment to the organization declined. And 12%, and even though that sounds low compared to the rest, it's still way too many. 12% said they left their job because of uncivil treatment. And 25% admitted taking their frustration out on customers. And customers is also co-workers, um, I also do um, train people on, on bullying in the workplace or bullying in schools. And normally um, it has been found that when people are being victimized, they go and victimize other people. So that 25% admitting that they took their frustration out on customers can be with customers or that can be with coworkers. But it is a huge percent of the effect. So ultimately, as we know, Everyone suffers, but if we're trying to make this work in an organization and the organization is taking the lead, the organization will suffer. So when we talk about respect in the office, there's little things we can do. We can put out the welcome mat, and what I mean by that is that when we are dealing with new people in our team, in our environment, ensure that they have the tools in, so that they know what to do in the event of. I heard a lot about the fact that policies are being written. Ensure that when they're, it's, that when they're being orientated that they get copies of these. It's important. Many people in organizations, they know there's policies, but they don't know where to get them from. And it's important that they have them, and orientation is the best place to get it. And leaders and staff, just like that manager, she proved that she didn't know what to do about it. So she's unlikely she knew what the policies were. And hopefully it was because she didn't know where to get it, but that is not the reason why you're still held accountable. Naturally, we should always practice common courtesy. We are a long time together. Now, people may get on your last nerve. You may have to um, deal with different types of emotion and characters, but the point is we are here to respect people. We do not have to like them. That doesn't always happen. We all have biases, but we are obligated to respect each other. We are together a long time. Eight hours, 10 hours, some people work 12, is a long time to be with a coworker. So we do have to reshift our minds Use effective communication when you're speaking to people. Sometimes people's, either it could be language or education level. It doesn't matter what um, organization you're in. We need to be able that we can um, communicate effectively with people. You saw in that last um, video, there was no good communication between the two people and they were both intelligent women, but their communication was a lack thereof. And then we should always proceed. I wanted to throw that in there because you would be surprised how many people talk about their day on social media. 
and I'm also including texting. It is one thing to you say, well, I don't use Facebook, but I'm I would be surprised if there wasn't at least 15% of the people in this room that has probably text someone about someone. It does happen, so be very careful. Be very careful. And if you see it, report it. And it goes back to the gentleman who just asked me that question earlier when he said, why can't you do something straight away? Yes, see it, do something straight away. You can report it straight away, or you can tell the person straight away that it is inappropriate what it is that they are doing. It is inappropriate. Okay. So when we look at achieving cultural competency and respecting our coworkers, there are, it's not always easy, and sometimes we really need to think about it really carefully. So we need to be aware and accept that we are all different. It doesn't matter if we're the same color. It doesn't matter if we're the same age. It doesn't matter. It, it just doesn't matter if we come from the same country. It doesn't matter if we do different jobs. We are all so different. The only thing that every single one of us have in this room in common is that we all work here. That's it, that's the only thing, unless there's somebody who doesn't work here. But you all work here, that's what you have in common. Okay, so we have to be aware and we have to accept and know that we are not the same. I always, um, in one of my classes, I tell people, you know, people um, look at myself and my husband and other the fact that we are, one's a man and one's a woman, we both have the same color complexion, we both like the same thing, we're both clergy, we are both similar in age, and then I open my mouth. And then people realize there is a world of difference between us. He was born and bred in Harrisburg, I was not, just in case anybody didn't notice. So the thing is, is that even though we are so together in ourselves as one unit married, we are so different, and that's what it is when you're with, with your coworkers. Okay, you have to be, be aware of who you are. It's very important that you understand who you are. And it's a bit like, you know, you're on, a, on an airplane and they say, before you go and put an oxygen mask on someone else, make sure you're breathing, make sure you put yours on first. Because you can't help someone or understand somebody's nuances or their qualities unless you really understand who you are first. Okay, and then you need to understand the dynamics of the difference. How can you, you know, there's the certain words, there's certain things that you might do that might offend someone. It's important that if you are going to spend time with that person that you understand what they are. You can insult people without even realizing it. But the point is it's their perception. So it's important that we understand. Development of a cultural knowledge. And that's if you so choose. I mean, some people, they really want to understand who their co-worker is and, and um, you know, the time that you spend together. What do I know about this person? What I want to know. doesn't mean we have to be nosy. We just have to understand because we can support each other better. That's what it's about. It's not trying to find out what do you do after work, what are your social habits or not, as the case may be. It's about how can we work together better? And then we should adapt our knowledge in order to um, address any situations that arise. How would we deal with it? How would the person deal with it? Because in some areas, there are going to be situations where you need the support of each other. So you need to really figure that out. And all of that sounds like, okay, well, I need an example of it and so on. But once you get to know your coworker and you know what ticks and what doesn't tick, that will help you in situations. Okay, so I think that may be it. So I'll say thank you at this point. I wasn't sure if there was a questions and answers. I don't know what I can answer, but I certainly will if I can. But I certainly thank you for having me here and listening to me. Okay. And we have a few minutes for questions. 